Hi there. So in today's lecture, I want to review the different kinds of thermodynamic potentials that we have for us. And remember that we're using Schroeder's Thermal Physics, and this is covered in section 5.1 of that book. So we've already discussed the enthalpy, but I am going to give it a review because I want to go over all the free energies that we've got. So the enthalpy, remember, was defined as H, um, and H is equal to U plus PV. And this is the energy used to react chemicals from their most stable pure forms and push the atmosphere out of the way to make room for those new compounds. Or, if you're going the other way with the reaction, the energy that you get when the system is annihilated. Okay? Now remember that it's the most stable pure form. So for example, oxygen won't be elemental oxygen in the tables, okay? Because that's not stable. The most stable pure form um, here on planet Earth would be O2, okay? So that's the uh, enthalpy um, that we're talking about here. And you have these big tables with enthalpies of formation in them, and you can track what the change in the enthalpy would be for any given reaction. So the enthalpy, though, isn't often the most useful definition, and so we're going to define other quantities, other thermodynamic potentials, and each serves their own purpose and is useful under different circumstances. So the new ones that we're going to introduce today are the Helmholtz free energy, F, and the Gibbs free energy, G. So the Helmholtz free energy, F, is defined as U minus TS, and the Gibbs free energy, G, is defined as U minus TS plus PV. Now, Schroeder has a nice memory aid for this. Um, if you write U and then FGH in clockwise alphabetical order there, and then you remember that for this little matrix in this little square, if you're going to go to the right, you subtract TS, and if you're going to go down, then you add PV. So, for example, F is one step to the right of U, and so all you're doing is subtracting TS. So F is U minus TS. H is one step down, so H is U plus PV. But G is one step to the right and a step down, and so you both subtract TS and add PV. And so G is U minus TS plus PV. So that's a nice little mnemonic if that helps you remember it, or memory aid, I guess. Um, so let's go over when each of these free energies is used. So remember that the enthalpy is often useful under constant pressure situations. And so Really, what we're looking at when we're looking at any of these thermodynamic potentials is not the raw value of H or any of the other thermodynamic potentials, but so much what happens when there is a change, and then you track the change in that uh, thermodynamic potential. And so let's say that we're going to take something through a process, and we want to then track the change in enthalpy, remembering that enthalpy is most often used at constant pressure. And so that would give us a delta H, now, for example, if you do the full delta for H, delta H would be delta U plus P delta V plus V delta P. But enthalpy is most often used in constant pressure situations. And so the delta P times V situation, that would go to zero because we're interested in a constant pressure. And so then we're left with delta H is equal to delta U plus P delta V. Now, if we plug in for delta U from the first law of thermodynamics, which says that the change in the internal energy of the system is the heat plus the work, then we end up with delta H is Q minus P delta V plus other forms of work, and then we're subtracting off P delta, or adding on P delta V from the delta H. And so the minus and plus P delta Vs, they cancel out. And then the only thing that we're left with in our delta H would be Q plus any other forms of work. So in the absence of other forms of work, um, like electrical, for example, um, the change in the enthalpy is just the heat, Q, necessary to make that reaction occur, or in reverse, the heat released. Okay, so that's enthalpy. Let's talk about one of the new ones, the Helmholtz free energy. When is heat useful? Well, the Helmholtz free energy is most often used for constant temperature situations, okay? So, if you uh, make deltas out of your F so that you can track the, pro the value, the change in the Helmholtz free energy with some process, then delta F would be equal to delta U minus delta T times S minus S times delta T. But it's most often used at constant temperature situations. So the term with the delta T in it, that would go to zero. And that just leaves us with delta F is equal to delta U minus T delta S at constant temperature. Now, plugging in for delta U 
from the first law of thermodynamics. We have delta F is equal to Q plus W minus T delta S. Okay? Now remember, if the process is quasi-static, which means slow, then Q is equal to T delta S. But if it's not a slow process, if it's not quasi-static, then Q is going to be less than T delta S. But either way, it's always going to be true that delta F will be less than or equal to the work at constant temperature. So for example, if it's quasi-static, Q is equal to T delta S, and then Q and the T delta S cancel one another out. But if the process isn't quasi-static, then the heat will be less than T delta S, okay? And so that means that you're gonna have some numbers subtracted off from the work, right? Which would leave delta F less than W, okay? But you can always write this inequality, delta F is less than or equal to W at constant temperature and have it be true. So this includes all the work, and that's even the work done automatically by moving the atmosphere out of the way. So you can think of the Helmholtz free energy as the energy that you need to create the system not considering the heat that is transferred isothermally kind of for free, right? So remember that isothermal processes are slow and F gets used a lot in upper level statistical mechanics classes and also some in describing geological processes which are on long time scales. Um, and so that's when it gets used. So now let's talk about Gibbs free energy. When is it useful? Okay, so G is equal to U minus TS plus PV. Now, G is often used in constant temperature and constant pressure situations. So if you were to do all of the deltas, then you would have delta U minus delta T times S minus S times delta, v, delta T plus delta P times V plus P times delta V. But if you've got constant temperature and pressure, then the delta T and the delta P terms go to zero. And so you're just left with delta G is delta U minus T delta S plus P delta V at constant temperature and pressure. Now, if we plug in for delta U from the first law of thermodynamics, then we have Q plus the work for delta U, which would be Q minus P delta V, the compression expansion work, plus the other forms of work, and then now minus T delta S plus P delta V. Okay, we're gonna pull that same trick that we did in the other free energies of thermodynamic potentials. If the process is quasi-static, which means slow, then Q is equal to T delta S. And that would mean that the Q here would cancel out with the minus T delta S there. If the process isn't quasi-static, then Q is less than T delta S, okay? Now, either way, this minus P delta V and the plus P delta V, they cancel each other out, okay? So, whether it's quasi-static or not, we're still gonna end up with delta G is less than or equal to the other forms of work at constant temperature and pressure. Now these other forms of work would be, for example, electrical energy that might get transferred to the system by hooking up some electrodes within a solution or something like that. This quantity is really useful um, and it gets used a lot in both chemistry and physics and so um, because of all the materials applications for it. And so there's tables and tables full of uh, the in, uh, Gibbs free energies for different substances um, at set temperatures and pressures. Okay, so we can also relate these thermodynamic potentials to each other. One common relation that you'll see is the relation between enthalpy and the Gibbs. So here, remembering that delta H is Q plus the other forms of work, and delta G is Q plus other forms of work minus T delta S, we learned that on the previous slide, then we can say that delta H minus T delta S is equal to delta G, right? Okay, now your textbook gives enthalpies and gives free energies for substances in the table at the back. There's some, you can find more exhaustive tables on the internet and in some um, handbooks, um, but in the back of the book, you're not going to find the Helmholtz free energies as much. They're a bit less useful um, for chemists and physicists, but there you go. The table in the back of your book also gives the entropies of some substances at, say, for example, in the table in your book, one bar of pressure and 298 Kelvin for one mole of the material. So let's go through an example problem for the electrolysis of liquid water and use these tables and talk about how to handle them in reactions, these quantities and reactions. 
So <clears throat> your book gives this reaction as an example. Water can become its component gases, hydrogen and oxygen. So you have H2O yielding H2 plus one half a mole of O2. Now the enthalpy of formation for water is minus 285.83 kilojoules when it's in its liquid state. And you can read that um, right here off the table, okay? And that's at, of course, one bar and 298 Kelvin for one mole of the substance, okay? Now that means that um, this reaction, what's going to happen is um, if you look at the right-hand side of this reaction, you have H2 and O2. Now reading in the table, the delta H for a formation, the enthalpy of formation for H2 is zero, and also for O2, it's also zero when it's in its gaseous state, okay? Um, and that means that it's already in its pure, most elemental stable form at 298 Kelvin in one bar. So if you were to do the enthalpy, uh, change in enthalpy for this reaction, you would do the uh, enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants, the right-hand side enthalpy minus the left-hand side enthalpy. So since um, there's zero on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side we have minus 285.83, then it would be zero minus minus 285.83, and that would give you an enthalpy for the reaction of plus 285.83 kilojoules, okay? Now, we could also figure out what delta G would be from these tables, okay, doing much the same thing. H2O liquid here would be minus 237.13, and then if you look in the table, for hydrogen and oxygen in their gaseous state, you can see the Gibbs um, formation would be zero. So yet again, you should get 237.13 kilojoules for this reaction because it would be zero minus a minus 237.13 kilojoules. But let's also prove this relationship, that delta H minus T delta S is equal to delta G, okay? Let's prove that this is true. Now note that looking at these tables, you can see what the entropies are for one mole of the substance of 298 Kelvin and one atmosphere of pressure in this fourth column of the table, okay? So what we could do is we could calculate the entropy change for this reaction by taking the entropy of the right-hand side components and subtracting off the entropy of the left-hand side. And then we could multiply that change in entropy times the temperature stated for this table, which would be 298 Kelvin, and check and see that it um, is the same. So let's do that right now, okay? If you read off the entropies in the table uh, for water, hydrogen, and oxygen respectively, right, we have the entropy of liquid water would be 691.69.91 joules per Kelvin. If you look at hydrogen, that would give you an entropy of 130.68 joules per Kelvin, and a mole of oxygen would be 205.14 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so if we calculate the delta S doing the um, products minus the reactants, right-hand side minus left-hand side, we'd have 130.68 joules per Kelvin for the hydrogen, plus one-half, because we only have half a mole of oxygen, one-half times 205.14 joules per Kelvin for the oxygen, and then we would subtract off the entropy of a mole of liquid water, which would be minus 69.91 joules per Kelvin, and that would give us a change in um, uh, entropy for the reaction of 163.34 joules per Kelvin. So if we multiply that now times T, we'd have 298 Kelvin times 163.34, and that gives us about 48.7 kilojoules. Now, if we take our delta H for that reaction, which was 285.83 kilojoules, and subtract off the T delta S, which would be 298 times 163.34, then we do find that delta G is approximately 237 kilojoules. You might get differences with rounding, but it's right around there, okay? Now, this um, delta G, of course, is the other work that is needed to make the reaction go, okay? So if you wanted to do, for example, electrolysis of liquid water, if you wanted to take water, and form hydrogen and oxygen out of it, you would have to add energy. So I specifically do a demonstration in class where I hook up a nine volt battery to some electrodes within a cup of water, and you can do this one at home, it's, it's easy to do. Um, then you'll see gas bubbles forming on one of your electrodes, and that's the hydrogen and the oxygen um, that's breaking apart from the water. 
Okay, so if you think about our definition of our Gibbs free energy, delta G is delta U minus T delta S plus P delta V plus the other forms of work, right? Then, um, I'm sorry, delta U is delta G is T, delta U minus T delta S plus P delta V. Then you can rearrange that equation and you can get delta U is equal to delta G plus T delta S minus P delta V. So this um, figure that we have in our textbook, this kind of illustrates that. The change in the internal energy of the whole system is 282 kilojoules. Now, that comes from the other forms of work, which would be the electrical work here, 237 kilojoules. And then there's some heat that enters the system kind of for free, right? Because it's um, an isothermal process. So we have 49 kilojoules entering the system by heat. And then when the gas forms, there's a P delta V that leaves, right? Because four kilojoules is being used to push that other water out of the way and make way for the gas. Now, if you run this uh, reaction in reverse and you react hydrogen and oxygen to make water, then that's what happens inside of a fuel cell. So fuel cells combine hydrogen and oxygen to form water. So that reaction would read H2 plus one half mole of oxygen O2 yields H2O. Now, the mathematics would be basically the same, um, except the signs would be flipped. So here, the delta G would be 237.13 kilojoules, and that would be the energy or electricity you could get out of the fuel cell, okay? And then the T delta S that we found before, that 49 kilojoules, that would be the waste heat created when the fuel cell runs, okay? Now, if you wanted to calculate the efficiency of a fuel cell, which might be used, um, for example, to power a big truck or something, okay? Then remember, an efficiency is always what you get over what you give, okay? So here, the work would be the gives, right? What you're getting out of that reaction, the electricity produced by the fuel cell. So that would be, work would be set equal here to the delta G, which is 237.15 kilojoules. Now, what you give, that would be H, delta H, your enthalpy. So if you take the ratio of delta G over delta H, that would give you the ideal efficiency of a fuel cell that does this reaction. And so if you take 237.15 kilojoules and divide it by 285.83 kilojoules, you get 0 0.83. So 83% would be an ideal fuel cell efficiency. But of course, real fuel cells are less than that. They don't achieve ideal conditions, and oftentimes maybe around 60%, maybe a little lower, but still, that ideal efficiency is a lot higher than the ideal efficiency for an auto cycle gasoline engine efficiency. So here's a little um, schematic of what a fuel cell looks like. Um, this is public domain here from the Wikipedia. And real fuel cells do come in a lot of types. Um, the hydrogen and oxygen reaction is called a proton exchange membrane fuel cell. And oftentimes in class, and if you miss class, I encourage you to watch this lecture uh, or this short video, it's just five minutes or so, how it's made, hydrogen fuel cells, you can look that up on YouTube, and um, that's a good one to watch. And so we'll just go over this cute little schematic here. You have hydrogen fuel that's channeled through the fuel flow plates to an anode on one side of the fuel cell, while oxygen and air, usually air, because um, you know our air is 20% oxygen roughly, is channeled to the cathode on the other side of the cell. And then at the anode, you have a catalyst. Oftentimes they use platinum for a good catalyst for the reaction, and that causes the hydrogen to split into positive hydrogen ions, uh, which are of course protons, and negatively charged electrons. And then after that, you have a polymer electrolyte membrane, or a PEM, that allows only the positively charged ions to pass through it to the cathode, and the negatively charged electrons then travel along the electrical circuit to the cathode, and that creates your electrical current. And then once at the cathode, the electrons and the positively charged hydrogen ions combine with oxygen to form water, and it flows out of the cell. Okay? So that's what happens there. All right, to conclude this lecture, I'd like to do another example problem from Schroeder, and this is uh, problem six and seven of chapter five. This is a fun one. So if you think about a muscle, then it can be thought of as a little fuel cell, which produces work, and what it does to produce work is metabolize glucose. So that reaction is shown here, okay? So C6H12O6, that's the glucose, 
plus six oxygens, um, six moles of oxygen, 6O2, yields, of course, carbon dioxide and water, 6CO2 plus 6H2O. So the question is, determine the change in the gives and the change in the enthalpy for this reaction for one mole of glucose. Assume, of course, the reaction that takes place at 298 Kelvin and one bar so that you can use the tables in the back of the book. Part B says, what's the max amount of work that a muscle can perform for each mole of glucose consumed? Part C says, how much heat is absorbed or expelled during the metabolism of a mole of glucose? And then Part D says, use the concept of entropy to explain why heat flows in that direction. Okay, so let's go through this. Now, I've already done this reaction for the enthalpy change. Um, so uh, that delta H for the reaction is negative 2803.04 kilojoules. So that one was done previously. Um, but anyway, if you missed that, it, it's a pretty easy exercise to do. And you can find it the same in the same techniques that we're going to use to find delta G. So here, let's find delta G together. If you um, look in our tables in the back of your book that I showed you earlier in the lecture, but you can also just take my word for it if you'd like to, um, you can look up what the uh, Gibbs of formation is for these various compounds. Now at 298 Kelvin or more bar, um, the uh, Gibbs of formation for glucose is negative 910 kilojoules. Oxygen is zero because it's already in its most um, stable elemental form. Carbon dioxide is negative 394.36 kilojoules, and then of course uh, liquid water there, we already went over, is negative 237.13 kilojoules. So if you look at the um, Gibbs on the right-hand side and the left-hand side of this reaction, you would have on the left-hand side negative 910 kilojoules, and then on the right-hand side uh, 6 times negative 394.36 kilojoules plus 6 times negative 237.13 kilojoules. So if you add up the Gibbs of formation on the right-hand side, you get negative uh, 3,788.94 kilojoules, and then on the left, negative 910 kilojoules. So remember, you always do the products minus the reactants. And so if you do negative 3788 minus a negative 910, then you end up with a Gibbs of negative uh, 2878.94 kilojoules. So that's part A, okay? Now, what that tells us, which was part B, is that the max amount of work that a muscle could perform for each mole of glucose consumed is 2878.94 kilojoules. And of course, that assumes ideal conditions. Now, what it's asking next, remember it says how much heat is absorbed or expelled, and then use the concept of entropy to explain why heat flows that way. So, the heat would be equal to the difference of delta G and delta H, because delta H minus delta G is T delta S. We talked about that relationship earlier. And so if you take the difference between the enthalpy and the Gibbs for this reaction, you get negative 2803.04 kilojoules minus a negative 2878.94 kilojoules, and that gives you 75.9 kilojoules. Now, the amount of work done, the delta G, is greater than the change in enthalpy, and so you can set that equal to um, uh, T delta S, and then you could divide out by T, right? So the 75.9 kilojoules divided by 298 Kelvin will give you the entropy change for the reaction, right? So 75.9, that should be kilojoules, sorry for the typo, divided by 298 Kelvin gives you 262 joules per Kelvin. So that's the entropy change. And since the system is gaining entropy um, in that direction, T delta S is positive, that means that heat flows into the system, okay? All right, let's talk about problem 5-7. It keeps going with this glucose thing. The metabolism of glucose actually occurs in a lot of steps. It's not quite as simple as what happens here, right? This is very straightforward, but it actually happens in a lot of steps. And that results in the synthesis of 38 molecules of ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, out of ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and phosphate ions. So when the ATP splits into ADP and phosphate, it liberates energy that's used in important processes, including muscle contraction. So in a muscle, the ATP-ADP reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called myosin, and that's attached to a muscle filament. So as the reaction takes place, the myosin molecule pulls on an adjacent filament, and that causes that muscle to contract. The force that it exerts averages about 
four picot newtons and acts over a distance of 11 nanometers. So from that data and the results of the previous problem, 5.6, compute the efficiency of a muscle. All right. So the energy from the metabolism of a mole of glucose per glucose molecule, remember that everything that we figured out was per mole. So if you take the energy that we found, 2878.94 kilojoules, and divide it by a mole, right, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, then um, per glucose molecule you have 4.78 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Now that energy, that 4.78 times 10 to the minus 18 joules, is split um, in between 38 ATP molecules. So you divide that by 38 and you get 1.26 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Now some of that energy is used to do work. So work is of course, from physics we know, the force over the distance. So if you assume that the force um, and the displacement of the muscle fiber are in the same direction, then you could multiply the force, which is four piconewtons times 11 nanometers, and you get 44 times 10 to the minus 21 joules. So if you do what you get over what you give, right? So what you get would be the work and what you give would be the energy per ATP. Then 44 times 10 to the minus 21 joules divided by 1.26 times 10 to the minus 19 joules is 0 0.35, which would make your muscle 35% efficient. Okay, um, I hope that was clear. I hope you understood it. Let me know if you have any questions. And as always, I'll see you in class.